11. Not 111, but 11. I sing the mighty power of God.
Saturday, next prayer breakfast, 8 o'clock in the morning. New York, be here. Okay? Uh, let's do this. If you're thinking, guys, let's get a little bit of an idea. If you're going, if you're right now, you're planning on being here. Remember, now you're not signing in blood, okay? But you're, you're, you're saying, no, as far as I know, I'm planning on being here on Saturday for the men's prayer breakfast. Go ahead and get your hand up. Anybody? There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I got you already. Eleven. Okay, good. I got you, Tommy. Uh, there are at least a, a dozen, at least a dozen. I think we probably got a plan for maybe 15 or so. And it's uh, a good time of fellowship. I'm looking forward to that and a uh, good time of prayer with you men. Uh, how many of you uh, have uh, seen or heard about this Asbury revival thing that's been going on? Uh, I, I, I don't take a whole lot of position on something like that because I really don't know what's going on. It's a lot of people take positions on things and don't really know what they're talking about. And uh, matter of fact, I try to stay away from Facebook the crazy thing because I got friends of mine fighting on Facebook over the crazy thing. But I'm gonna tell you what, anytime the name of Jesus is lifted up and I'm not sure exactly what's going on, I'm not gonna pick up a stone and throw it. Amen. That's all I can say. That's just my position. I, I don't know. If there's violations of doctrine, I don't know about that. If there are things that are going on that shouldn't, I, I don't know about that. But I'm gonna tell you this, I have a hard time believing that the devil's happy when people praise right. the Lord. Amen. Amen. I, I really do. I have a hard time. So I want to give a little bit on that. And, uh, but I hope that you understand that as a church, we want to be doctrinally correct. Uh, really to the point, we want to be doctrinally pure as much as we possibly can. And so uh, we're not giving up doctrine and I'm not endorsing anything. But I love it when the name of Jesus is lifted up. I love it when uh, Jesus gets some headlines. Somebody said that about the Super Bowl as well. I, I heard some criticism about the, I guess there were some Jesus commercials on, yeah. uh, on the, for the Super Bowl. I'm not so sure those were the best things in the world, but you know, it's better than seeing a commercial for Budweiser. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and I don't know, I, don't, I never saw the commercials. But I, I tell you, I don't think the devil's happy when instead of a Budweiser commercial, you see a Jesus commercial. I have a hard time believing that the devil's happy about that. And it uh, gets people thinking. And uh, God knows we need revival. So I thought I'd just say that just because there's a lot of, uh, I've had a couple of questions about it. Uh, you know, where do you stand on that? I stand uh, uh, right here. I, <laughs> I really don't have an opinion because I don't know what's going on. Other than I appreciate it when somebody's bold enough to say something positive about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. I really am. So, uh, I don't know how did I get on that, but uh, I thought I would say that. Uh, there is a choir practice this Friday at 6.30, correct? Choir practice this Friday at 6.30, and uh, we're looking forward. It's not in the bulletin yet, but uh, what we are going to do to follow the same pattern we did last year for Easter. I thought it worked out great. During the Sunday school hour, we had a, a breakfast here at the church on Easter morning, uh, Easter breakfast, and uh, then we uh, had our cantata in the morning service and some preaching, preaching the gospel. This is a great opportunity. Even right now, we're going to get some fl flyers made up and thanks for this. It's just a good thing to post something at work or be able to hand it to a friend or to a neighbor. Uh, sometimes people only go to church on Easter and Christmas. Well. Bless their hearts. We want them to come here uh, for Easter and for Christmas. And uh, I guarantee you this. I'll, I'll, I'll make you a promise. You bring your loved ones. Uh, I'm not I, I'm not going to preach on a whole bunch of divisive stuff other than the preaching of the cross as to them that perish foolishness, the Bible says. But they will hear the gospel. You bring somebody on Easter to our church, the gospel very clearly, very plainly will be presented. Not only in song, but from the pulpit. And uh, there will be an invitation for people to receive Christ. So just start be thinking about that and uh, start planning for that. Let's see, well, there is a church business meeting right after the service tonight. Uh, it will only take a few minutes, but uh, it's just, I think it's very important to have a monthly update. We've got one or two things that we're going to be bringing to you. All right, well, we have our ushers come at this time to receive our evening offering.
Next Sunday evening after the service, we will be having a vacation Bible school workers meeting and there's some information on the back of the bulletin concerning that as well and starting to get our, our plans together for vacation Bible school. Brother David, why don't you pray for us? Would you please for all? Oh, Heavenly Father, would you be the blessed church? Heavenly Father, raise your Holy Spirit and call to the church that everybody shall be Father. Open thy ears and give you listen to this word. Heavenly Father, and Heavenly Father, let's get out the blessings you have to hear the truth from your Father. And bless our church, bless our love and our family. Heavenly Father, for we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And you are the author, Heavenly Father, that you can get. Heavenly Father, for it's not, it's not in vain for that cross that you died in, Father. You did it for me. Your mm -hmm. death was a not in vain, Heavenly Father. Thank you for dying for my sin and for those who have Praise Amen.
Then after that, after that's where God was dealing with the whole human race. And God has always dealt with the whole human race, but uniquely he has then chose to deal with the, the, the Jews, the Hebrew people. And so you have, starting there in chapter 12, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in the book of Genesis. That's the divisions of the book of Genesis. Creation, fall, flood, total Babel, those four. Uh, that's the, 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 uh, the world, uh, all mankind. And then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, as God has now focused on the, the Hebrew nation. And um, now I want to just sort of bring this into to Daniel chapter 3. I want you to sort of talk back to me just a little bit, okay? And uh, so uh, some of these things are obvious, but I, I want to make some connection here. Uh, we see Daniel chapter 3, and this is de dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king, king of what kingdom? Babylon. Babylon. Okay? All the way back in those, uh, in, in the chapter uh, 10 and chapter 11, the book of Genesis, I believe it's 10 and 11, it deals with the Tower of Babel. Uh, and that Tower of Babel, you have a leader, there was a human organization that was established there that was contrary to God. It was false worship. It was a it was a rebellion against God. There was pride involved where they determined that they were going to set up a, uh, a tower. They were going to build a tower all the way up to God. And the audacity of the thing is what is staggering. Just absolute audacity. Uh, that they were going to actually construct something that was going to go up into heaven itself and, uh, and all I could think is that they wanted to assault the very kingdom of God. I don't think it was to worship God. And so they have, and this is the beginning of what we have here as the nation of Babylon. Uh, the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were modern day, does anybody know what country? Iraq. Iraq. Where modern day Iraq is. Uh, Iran was Persia. And then you had Iraq was dealing with Babylon. And these were the ancient civilizations. The Garden of Eden was somewhere in that area. And uh, so it was as, as old as Genesis 1 uh, was this. And so you, you have this going on. And now you have a kingdom that has been established. Now the reason why I said that is because uh, you have Abraham. Does anybody know where Abraham came out of? Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. You look that up with the Chaldees, that's the Sumerians, which were the ancestors of the Babylonians, and you have these kingdoms that were all set up there. There's a line here, is what I'm trying to say, is that there is a line here, and you had the, the old Babylonian dynasty, first Babylonian dynasty, and it had to do with Ur of the Chaldees. And so you have the, the father of the, the Hebrew race, Abraham, Father Abraham, coming out of Babylon, going to the promised land. Okay, that's what we, we see. And so then eventually we see the establishment of the nation of Israel uh, with uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, uh, his sons, with Joseph. There are those four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, at the end of at the end of Genesis. Uh, and they are establishing the 12, they have the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the, uh, you have uh, Moses now in Exodus. You have Joshua coming in and then conquering the land, dividing the land, sending, setting up the nation of Israel. Now, many years later, what's happened, you still have Babylon. But now you have Israel. And what's happening now is in that first dynasty, you have ever heard of a fellow by the name of Hammurabi? Mm -hmm. Okay, and he set up laws and codes for living. Uh, he is, uh, in secular, se secular uh, history, he would be sort of alongside of Moses as a lawgiver. Do you know that even in secular history, they honor Moses as a lawgiver, although we know that the law came from God Almighty to Moses. Yeah. But you have Moses and you have also, it's called the Code of Hammurabi, that was something that was an establishment that even our 
uh, the, the Ten Commandments and the, the, the European uh, model of, 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 of law and order was from, part of it was from Babylon. And then part of it is from over here in Israel. So it's just kind of interesting that we see this kind of a mesh going through, and you have this uh, uh, first dynasty with uh, someone like Hammurabi, and then you have a second dynasty that's going on in Babylon, and this is where we see Nebuchadnezzar. It's a different family, and that's usually when a dynasty would end, is when the, the, the throne would transfer from one family to another family. So you have Nebuchadnezzar now in, the, in, in Daniel chapter 3, and is it Daniel chapter 4 where we go to Belshazzar, or Daniel chapter 5 uh, with the handwriting on the wall, and then we see the end of the Babylonian Empire. Now I didn't say that just to give you a lecture on, on history and geography. Uh, the, the thought here is that there has been interaction between Babylon and Israel all the way back from in Genesis. But now Babylon is being used by God to discipline <coughs> the people of Israel. And uh, there's another, another bit of history. I could, I could get lost in the weeds here, but there's so much going on. Does anybody know how many years the, the Jews spent in bondage to Babylon? 70 years. And what that was, that number, se that number 70 had to do with the Sabbaths that the nation of Israel had forsaken. It took that many years of Sabbaths basically to catch up. And God was saying, you're not going to give it, I'm going to take it. Because I want you to serve me, I want you to live for me. So God is doing that. So he used Nebuchadnezzar, he came in maybe three different times, I believe, and this is what they would do. Uh, they would go into the country, and they would, uh, they would, first what they're trying to do is take the best of the, the Hebrews, the brightest young men, and they're, they're, they, they, they make them eunuchs. And then they have them, they teach them the way of the Babylonians. So that now you have Babylonian Jews. Okay? They try to, to indoctrinate them so that they don't have problems with the people of Israel. Well, the people of Israel were different than other people. They're stubborn. They, they were not. And this is not the Romans had the same problem with the people of Israel. Uh, so the next time they went in, they were, they were not wanting to be subject to Babylon. So they went in. The first time they took royalty and uh, intellectuals to try to train them to be leaders. The second time they went in, uh, they, took, they took the craftsmen and the businessmen and, and that middle class, they took them uh, and put them into, into bondage in Babylon. And then finally they made a clean up and they said, we want to get some slaves and some, meat and some manual workers here. We got, uh, we've, got our, uh, we've got our royalty, we've got our white collar, we need some blue collar. So they went in and basically then took just about everybody else out of Israel. So that's, that's what's happening here with, with Babylon. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He's doing it because God wanted to get the attention of the nation of Israel. But here Nebuchadnezzar is a, a man of nearly absolute authority. Nebuchadnezzar could do almost anything Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do. And so that's why when we get to Daniel chapter 3, we see that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hanani, Azariah, and Shaph, these are, the, that was their, uh, Daniel's Babylonian name was Belteshazzar, uh, meaning Bel is God or Bel is Lord. It was, it was a uh, of something to try to change their religion. And, but we see Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Michelle uh, were men that were elevated because of their wisdom. God gave them special wisdom. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar, thinking that he could do whatever he wanted, uh, he uh, built this <coughs> great statue and I'm just not reading the entire chapter. He built this great statue with a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and belly and thighs of brass and uh, legs of iron 
and feet and toes of iron mixed with clay. And he had that dream, and then there was a, uh, uh, I, I just said that wrong, I got two visions confused. That was the first vision, I'm sorry. Uh, he had just, it was a, it was a, uh, uh, vision, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, 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 image of gold, okay, uh, here in chapter 3, uh, now I'm confused, <laughs> image of gold whose height, was three, yeah, it was just gold, okay, and this one in chapter 3 is just gold, so this is an image that he made, he set it up in the plane, and he said, now on everybody, when you hear the band, when you hear the banjo and the mandolin and the, and the dobro and the guitar and the upright bass, you hear all those playing. Uh, everybody's just going to bow down and we're going to have unity. We're going to have unity in worship. Okay? Worship without doctrine could be really bad. Okay? And so we say, let's be unified. There's some things that we are just not going to be unified about, folks. And, and, and uh, uh, we don't always have to fight everybody, but we don't have to go along with it either. Just because the world is saying this is the way it ought to be, and other churches even are saying this is the way it ought to be, doesn't mean that's the way it ought to be. And so we get to take all of that through the filter of God's word. And so everybody bowed down. I don't know where Daniel was at this time. Daniel's not mentioned. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we all know the story. It's a Sunday school story. We, we know it. They refused to bow down, which brings us to uh, this uh, chapter 3 and verses 13, 14, 15. And what we're reading here, what I point that I want to make tonight, is that Nebuchadnezzar was surprised. He was surprised. Here he is, pretty much in his own mind, the king of the universe. He can do no wrong, and everybody's got to do what he says. And here's three men that refuse to do what he said to do. This was to Nebuchadnezzar's surprise. He couldn't believe it. If you read through here and see this, he was shocked. He was absolutely overwhelmed that these men would not bow down. So much so that he said, I'm sure that you didn't get it the first time, Joe. Uh, now here, let me explain this to you guys. He knew them. They worked closely with him. He was aware of where they came from. And then he said, now please guys, now listen. I don't know if he said please. But he said, listen now, when you hear the banjo, the dobro, and the, uh, uh, and the mandolin, and the, the guitar, and the upright bass, and the, the fiddle, uh, when you hear those, you're supposed to bow down. And I'm thinking this in my mind, then Nebuchadnezzar turns over to the band and he says, and the one, uh, and the two, uh, <laughs> uh, and the three. And they, they start playing, and those three men refuse to bow down. The Bible says to us that they that that he was wroth, that he was angry, that his he was furious. He could not believe. He was surprised. He was shocked. Here he is, the the uh, the presumed ruler of everything around him, everything that he could see in the then known world. There was nobody in opposition to him, but yet he was surprised. I got four things that he was surprised about in this story that might be a blessing to you. The first that surprise that I see is that Nebuchadnezzar was surprised that not everyone would bow down. I think that's just a simple thing. I mean, it was this. What? You won't bow down? So much so he was surprised so much so that this fiery furnace was almost a second thought. He wasn't thinking he was going to have to use the fiery furnace. Because when he was challenged, what did he do? Turned it up. Turned it up. He was incensed that somebody wouldn't follow his command. Nebuchadnezzar was surprised that not everyone would bow down. Now I wonder if there was more than three. I don't know that. The Bible specifically says three. These three. 
And uh, I don't know, maybe there were others that were hiding. Maybe there were others that were not uh, well known, that were not front and center and got away without bowing down. I don't know that, but I do know this. When Bush came to shove and they're standing in the midst uh, before the king and the band is playing, they would not bow down. And I believe that Nebuchadnezzar's jaw came unhinged and just about hit the ground. Why? Because he is the king. He is the supreme authority. He is the boss. He's, he's, the, one that can, uh, 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 he's the one that can cause their lives to be miserable. Look over to Ephesians chapter 6. Man, what a great uh, passage of scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 is. And we could uh, spend quite a bit of time. We have at different times spent in Ephesians chapter 6. But I, I just want to look at this one thing. You know, there's one phrase in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 13. It says here, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, comma, and having done all, comma, what's the next two words? To stand. We don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to all be Bible scholars, although we ought to be in the Word of God on a regular basis. We don't have to have the eloquence of a great orator or the talent or the wealth of people that we would consider great. God's not requiring that of His people. You know what God requires of us? He's saying, and having done all to stand, in other words, you prepared to stand, then it says, to stand. Sometimes we just have to stand. Well, I don't know if I'll make any difference at all. It doesn't matter. Just stand. I really don't know if I have strength enough. Well, just stand. And I, I'll even go as far as to say this. And maybe a little bit of uh, counter to the scripture. Just a little tiny bit. If you don't have the strength to stand, at least stand up in your mind and in your heart. Stand. There are some things that we ought not compromise on. Now, I, I, I learned this and I've tried to practice this in my life. And that is, if I can compromise to keep you as a friend and to keep our relationship uh, easy and, and uh, we're, you know, we're, we're walking along again, I will compromise whatever I can to be able to maintain our relationship. I will. Uh, anybody and everybody knows if you're going to have a good marriage, it takes a lot of compromise. It just does. Where do you want to go to eat, honey? Oh, wherever. Until you start pulling in the driveway. <laughs> or even worse than that. Uh, Just stand. Sometimes, guys, you just got to stand up against your wife. No. The idea is, is that, no, we got to compromise. Try to work it out. You know, often I find my, my wife doesn't want me to ask her where she wants to eat. She wants me to know where she wants to eat. <laughs> and that's the only way that I can fly, man. I tell you what, it's like throwing darts sometime at a dartboard. You know, hope that you get it right. Okay? Uh, you no. Know, uh, but you understand the compromise that comes in that relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's what I will just say. We just had a conversation just before we came over. And, and, and if I don't have something specifically planned for Mondays, uh, we usually like to get away somewhere and go someplace. I said, we, we talked about where do you want to go tomorrow? And it was like, here we go. We're going to have that discussion, are we? And, uh, but you know what we want to do? We want to compromise. We want to compromise. You know there are some things I will not compromise. And I don't have to be there with a big megaphone blasting it to everybody. But I am, I just, there's some things that I will not, you know, as your pastor, there's some things that I would not compromise on to be your pastor. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, if, uh, you know, let God be true. Uh, there's some things I would not compromise on. But you know, there are some things that I wouldn't compromise on that are not doctrine. To be able to maintain the relationship, I want to be your pastor. You know, there's some people that I'm friends with 
that I have to be very, very careful. I'm not talking about in here. I have to be very, very careful because there are triggers for them that if I know that if I trip that trigger, our friendship is damaged. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do everything I can to maintain that. You know, I've got family members. I've got uh, brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law who I really want to. I want them to think I'm a good guy. I want to be able to see them, fellowship with them, and, and, and say howdy to them, and not have a problem with them. Uh, my sister, for years, my sister and I were somewhat estranged from one another, and I'm so glad that we're not now. Uh, but, you know, I know that I could offend my sister, and my sister knows she, she could offend me very easily, because we have differences of opinion. So it's compromise. But, folks, there are some things that I will not compromise on. I remember one night we were over at my, my in-law's house. We used to spend, oh, we spent a lot of time at, our, at my in-law's house. And uh, boy, they fed us good. Never thought anything of it. Did we never thought anything of it? Man, I tell you, they fed us good. Then we just go home, you know. Uh, <laughs> we were there to eat in supper time. Let's go to go dance. And uh, oh, man, we had a good time over there. And one night we were sitting around, we were playing guitars and things. And her dad was an uh, amazing guy like that. And uh, we were playing guitars. He was teaching me how to play the mandolin. And, and one of uh, her brother's friends was there, and he had his arm in a cast. Her brother played in the band, and uh, this fellow, uh, he was he was rarely would we do this, but they had this, he was he was making a can of beer. Rarely would we stay there when the beer got open. We technically left, but at this point I don't know what the situation was. And he went like this. He took that can of beer. And Kendall was sitting at the table. I don't even know if you remember this. You were very little, and he pushed that can of beer towards Kendall and went. Kendall, Kendall, you remember? I, 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 I stood very tall, but at that point I looked at him and I said, if you want that other arm broken, <laughs> push that can of beer one more time towards my son. And just like that, that's what happened. It got, <laughs> you know, everybody got extremely quiet and you know, he didn't. He didn't. I remember one time walking through the mall, and uh, and a couple of guys were coming by. This was dumb. A couple of guys came by, and they were using some very foul language when walking in the mall. I just stopped, told my wife, I said, "Move forward, go on." I walked over and I said, "Don't you dare talk like that in front of my wife." And then there's two of them, and then they start posturing like, Ooh. "Okay, I don't know." What am I going to do now? I just had to stand my ground. I said, I, said, I told him something like this. I said, your mom will talk, taught you better than that. So that moment over there is a lady. Don't talk like that in front of a lady. And I could see the look on her face. A little embarrassed. See you later. Turn around and walk away. <laughs> I got out of that one. Okay. There's some things that I'm not going to stand for. I can't. And as Christians, there's some things that we must stand for. We must stand up for right. We must stand up for truth. We must stand up for the purity of the gospel. Uh, it's been more than one time that I've heard somebody take the name of the Lord uh, in vain in a barber shop, and I asked him to stop because I, I know him better than you do, and I know that he doesn't like it when you take his name in vain. And it comes just like that in the barber shop. It gets really quiet. But folks, if we're not going to stand, who's going to stand? Right. Hey, this library thing, who's going to stand up for the kids? Who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? Hey, there ought to be some things that we stand up for and we're not going to back down. And I believe that Nebuchadnezzar was a little surprised because he was used to everybody saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And there's three men standing up straight and tall. Saying, no, sir, won't do it. I believe that he was surprised. Sometimes all we have to do is just stand. I believe that that's the first thing he was surprised about. Secondly, I believe that as we look over here in verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. I'll get to the, other, the rest of it in just a minute. He was very surprised that he did not hold the keys to life and death. He was surprised. He saw those 
soldiers, those Babylonian soldiers that had uh, uh, brought the prisoners up and went to throw them in the furnace and they were consumed in the flame. You ever see something like that? A fire so hot that something a distance away from it all of a sudden went poof. Yeah. I think that's what happened to these guys. They didn't just fall over like, oh my, it's hot. And they <laughs> fell over. <laughs> I think it was like instantaneous combustion. I think they went kapoof. <laughs> if it didn't, it should have happened that way. But I believe that here he is, he's surprised. He's surprised that he didn't get to say who dies and who lives. Do you know that there's only one who gets to say who dies and who lives? He is the one who controls life and death. Look over in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And look at verse 27. I got several verses here. I'm going to read a couple. We know this verse. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, look at the rest of the verse. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and without salvation. What this is telling us is that there is only one who is in control of life and death. And that he's the very one who gave, yielded his life for our salvation. We're not supposed to fear death. We read that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I read these scriptures uh, uh, at a funeral. I read these scriptures at a, uh, often at a graveside. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, our scripture says here, in verse 52, in a moment, Oh, first we came up. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, and corruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immorality, uh, imm immortality. <laughs> so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because he's the one that controls death. I can understand an unsaved person being afraid of death. I've walked into the room with some of your loved ones and watched them go. I'm very privileged to sit next to my dad and watch him go. He didn't go to fear. <coughs> He didn't go with suffering or pain. My dad took a shallow breath over here and took a big gulp of fresh air into there. Hallelujah, man. Not, nothing to fear there. Sorrow? Well, of course. Of course, because I miss it. But my, there's nothing to fear. You know what there is? There's confidence. No, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe that his confidence was challenged because he was surprised that he wasn't in control of death. Let's look at next. And then we see the, uh, the, the rest of that in the last place. Had all kinds of neat stuff stuck in my Bible this morning, so that didn't happen. Uh, Daniel chapter 3. Uh, we, we see here, he, uh, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. Really what happened there is not only were they not, uh, he couldn't control their, their death, he couldn't even control their bondage. He wasn't in control of their bondage. 
And uh, he should walk in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt. And the form of the floor is like the Son of God. I believe this was a surprise to Nebuchadnezzar. I believe this was a surprise to everybody when they looked in there and they saw four guys walking around in there. That means that they were not in bondage. Walking around. That doesn't mean they were pounding on the walls. That doesn't mean that they were screaming out in pain. They were conversant. They were walking in the, and the form of the fourth man was like unto the Son of God. Here's a, a something I believe that he was surprised about. He was surprised that God was interested in three captives, three slaves. God was so interested in those three slaves that he not only preserved their life, he came and walked with them in the midst of the fiery furnace. He was surprised. Well, that does my heart good to know that God does not forsake his people in the midst of suffering. God is more real in the midst of suffering. I uh, had a friend uh, who had uh, put a, a quote from uh, uh, Dr. Lee Robertson, who was the longtime pastor of uh, Temple Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Tennessee Temple University. A, 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 an amazing man of God, amazing preacher. I got to talk with him in those latter years when he was in his 90s and spent a little bit of time with Lee Robertson. But a great, great giant of the faith. And uh, uh, somebody asked him in one of these, uh, he would go out and, and after he had retired from the, from the pulpit, he would go out and he would do pastor's meetings. And he would sit down, I, that's where I, as a young preacher, I was probably 27, 28 years old, got to sit down with a 90-year-old Lee Robertson. And uh, somebody asked him a question. They said, Dr. Robertson, God has used you to do some amazing things, some big things. What do you think of, what is the secret here? How, what, what is the secret to your success? And Dr. Robertson, they said that Dr. Robertson sort of put his head down a little bit. And, and, and tears rolled up in his eyes. And he said, the secret to any success that the Lord has all allowed me to have is suffering. Suffering. And we could go on a list of multiple things that happened in Lee Robertson's life that were, would, would, would crush us with his family and the loss of life and, and, and handicaps and struggles and and burdens that he had to carry through all his life. He said that those were the things, the suffering, the struggles of what brought about success. He said, because when I'm small, he's great. When I'm weak, he's strong. Amen. God did it all. He just used, allowed me, he just allowed me to be used. He was surprised that God cared about those three men in the furnace, that God cared about those three men in the furnace. And number four, he was surprised that the faith of the Hebrews was more powerful than his kingly decree. So I want to just challenge you, folks, that even when it looks like there's no hope, there's no, there's no future, there's no tomorrow, God is bigger than our circumstances. That's right. And even the decree of the king is subservient to the will of God. We have nothing to fear. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar in his pride, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar, you read on in, in chapters 4 and 5, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar's pride got him into a lot of trouble. And he would continue to be, even though at this point he worshipped the God of heaven, he turned right around and started doing other things that he shouldn't have done. And God had to, had to knock him down and knock him down hard. He was so surprised that he didn't always get his way. Here, folks, this is what I want to do here for our church. I don't want to come up with a plan and then ask God to get involved in it. That's backwards. What we want to do is find out what is God's plan and then we get involved in it. That's how we know we're going to have success. Find out what God wants to do and get involved with it. That, that you know you're going to be successful. The king opposed God himself and was shocked to find out that there's somebody that he had to answer to as well. Amen.
name, Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us to learn the lessons of Nebuchadnezzar. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to exercise wisdom. Lord, help us not to be fearful, even when there's opposition, even when there's struggle, even when there's heartache. Lord, I pray that you would help us to just to, just to stand. Lord, you don't ask much, much of us. You just need us to stand. Lord, I pray that we would know when to compromise and when not to compromise. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be good neighbors, but not to be those that are compromisers that would, uh, would delude, uh, dilute the gospel or your word. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that reaches for pure doctrine, but also looks out for the needs of others. Lord, I pray that we've learned these lessons. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.